for you, but uh, in the meantime, if, if uh, anyone has some, any questions or comments that they want to raise, or indeed if anybody wants to come forward and do a soapbox slot, either of their own volition or obviously of your own volition, but also we, we do have copies of, of Dear Scotland here, which is five minute monologues written by 20th Scotland's leading writers, including Liz Lockhead and so on. So if there's anybody of a thespian bent who wishes to uh, have a go at uh, Walter Scott or whatever else, so we have the text there and just come up and uh, blast us with it. Uh, the question I wanted to Alex, ask Alex, uh, that day when Cameron and Salmon signed the Edinburgh Agreement and somebody had very cleverly put a map on the wall behind them, was that you? Oh, uh, so yeah, yeah, I'll tell the story behind that. Um, so, the, the first one is an office in St Andrew's House. He doesn't like it, it's an ugly office, I'll tell you why it's an ugly office. Because when Jack McConnell was coming in as First Minister, the then Permanent Secretary, the episode service, thought, oh, I really fancy the First Minister's office. And so in a brief inter lull between First Ministers, <laughs> he shifted his office over to his gorgeous 1930s Art Deco office, which is really stunning. Um, and, and leaving the First Minister with this kind of pokey little addendum in sort of places. Um, and, and to show you what an uh, utterly irresponsible ruler I'd be, is my first action would be to say, yeah, I'm a nice office now. Whatever else is happening, I'm now having a nice office. <laughs> but, so th there's an office, and then uh, one of the great triumphant things of the night, 2011, for those in the Scottish National Party, was this sense that they had literally covered from coast to coast the map. If you did one of those constituency maps on the colour of who's won what constituency. And so this map was made up, and then someone said, oh, let's put the map up on the wall because the First Minister liked it so much. So actually it was there permanently. And we had several meetings in building up the Edinburgh Agreement, and one of which involved uh, Nick Clegg, um, who's evidently a very sweet man. Um, and he was sitting facing the map, and the map is, of course, for those not familiar with this, a kind of yellow, um, which is a bit like the Lib Dem yellow, you know, and it's not exactly the S&P yellow, because it's just, I don't know what the printers had. But so it's a kind of murky yellow color. But anyway, it's uniform, that's the point. So during the meeting with Nick Clegg, Nick um, was running out of things to say, and he clearly didn't really like talking about Sam, um, because you, you were briefed by senior civil servants that uh, those in London were convinced that he was some kind of wizard, and if you looked away, it's your soul. <laughs> Which was actually a great asset in negotiation. I just had to look at a shift at times, they all And Nick Clegg looked up and went, oh, oh, look at that man. Um, <laughs> Getting the party wrong. Um, so, but uh, before David Cameron came up, uh, you know, all sort of top ministerial teams have a kind of a front runners, if you like, go ahead to make sure a venue or whatever is suitable and safe or all this kind of stuff. And so the Downing Street team came up and saw the map on the wall and, and went, So then they said, which is the standard procedure is if you're at Downing Street, you send a kind of very strong, we want that removed. And the standard procedure um, in the SD government is to say, oh, right, in which case we're keeping it <laughs> on a deeply mature uh, ground level. But, uh, but then there was, uh, so I then suggested as a compromise, we could have two flags instead, which would be the Union Jack and the Sultan. And this they had worked through already. They didn't want any flags because that would smack too much of being in sort of Lancaster House and negotiating the end of the column. So um, uh, they didn't want any of that iconography. But they, but they came through on the day and had another attempt literally to take the thing off the wall, at which point I countered it rally with a get the flags. Uh, at which point they came and said, get the flags. And so anyway, the, the map stays up on the wall because it's always there. Um, but another funny, as there were two meetings with Cameron. And um, uh, what happens at these things is that a lot of the work of government, because of uh, uh, the, the rule about everything, freedom of information, so that when things get really important, of course, nothing gets written down at all. In fact, there's no witnesses whatsoever. <laughs> and, 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 and this is, this is, this is, it has a term, I can't now remember what the term is, but it's kind of some, like quiet time. Or something. Anyway, so it gets built into a diary so that deliberately ministers can have a, a period of time when they are alone, so sort of having a pee. And they go, oh, and do the deal. And so uh, Karen came up for the first meeting, and some sort of quiet time, or whatever it's called, was built into the diary so that uh, he and Alec could talk by themselves in this office. Um, but unfortunately, David Cameron's team were running ahead of time, which is incredibly unusual. 
um, in government to actually get ahead of the diary. So they were about 15 minutes ahead, and the, minute, the meeting started about 15 minutes ahead. It was very clear from the body language they just wanted to get out of there as soon as they possibly could. Obviously, no one had briefed the Prime Minister about the quiet time. So what was quiet time, which was meant to last sort of about eight minutes, suddenly stretched out to 25 minutes. And, uh, and at this point, we're all out in a corridor of the Secret Service, and there's sort of lots of, sort of bossy people running around with uh, sort of their phones and what have you. Um, and the two sides trying to make polite conversation without actually sort of tearing each other's eyes out. And then, and I mean, it seems I'm one of the few people aware that this, this quiet time has been built in because the dining street team would think. But no one quite has the, the nerve to knock on someone's door, you know, so leave it too much. You know, you, you have to have a kind of uh, a proper protocol for that. Uh, so anyway, we're stuck in the room for 25 minutes. And we had a good meeting, and so anyway, camera shoots off, we go back into the room, we debrief on the, the meeting and everything, we got what we wanted, we thought we had, and then it's all falling down, and I said to him, what did you talk about? I said, to him, I said, I only had about two minutes worth of two. So I just started again. <laughs> Well, I had a round with Leslie Smith about this, um, uh, so, so it must be worth something because you don't willingly go into that situation. Um, uh, there is obviously a strong constituency which is looking to Scandinavia and the Nordic countries, which is citing that. And I don't, I can see all the sense behind that, and it's very good to be able to cite an example. I think we're making a bit of an error in leaping to that rather than having a greater period of national reflection because fundamentally we're not the Scandinavians. You know, what they do, they've acquired through culture, time and habit uh, and it's an expression of their society. It's not that they are like us and they're just glued on this different habits. You know, they are an expression of their politics. So whilst I entirely admire a lot of what goes on in the Nordic countries, I think we're looking for a Scottish model uh, that starts from scratch. I mean, one of my criticisms of, of the broader debate is the assumption that, okay, there's, there's this kind of uh, rather superficial unionist case, there's the Scottish government case, oh, and then there's a kind of lefty case. Now, I'm deeply sympathetic to lots in the lefty case, but I'm also aware that having been in Scotland since the 1980s, uh, uh, flocking to the lefty answer is sometimes a comforting thing to do, and it's not necessarily going to be the best or the only answer for us. My caution here is that we do have a sort of developed state to make some quite tough decisions because we don't have the money for some of the things that we used to have the money for. My sympathy is entirely with some of these lefty answers, but I think I'm trying to inject a sense that we might be better as a nation giving ourselves a bit more time and a greater sense of shared purpose before we start to do things. Partly because we have to convince the wealthy of this country that they need to start paying a bit more for the poor of this country. I don't think the way to do that is to wake up on the 19th and say we're going to come and get you above us. I think the way to do that is to say there is a purpose to this. And the purpose is actually that in the long run, the state will become cheaper. The more we can spend money early on in people's lives, the models show the less you know how to spend on law and order and on training and on all manner of other things of the state. But these are, you know, one of the, as I say, delightful things about Scotland is we've proven ourselves to be smarter than the politicians. We're capable of handling the ambiguity. We're capable of debating things without some, having to reach for some easy answer. So whilst, um, you know, it, 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 it would be lovely to be, to wake up with a much better society overnight, but I give us 20 years after a yes vote before we're really beginning to see the product of our labels. Hi there. Uh, I've, I've picked up with reading Jerry Hassan's uh, colleague in Adrian in there because they mentioned something about uh, Mine's bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so have you had to say on that, Jerry? Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a, 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 something I hadn't heard of before in Finland, which apparently was uh, was outside of party political um, you know, parameters called Finland 2030 or something, was it something like that? Yeah. And, and it, basically, I suppose what I'm getting at, it, 
is there a practical uh, framework, do you think, in the real world that um, after the referendum, the SNP and, and Labour, which uh, and which is where a lot of the you know this consensus building and agreement is probably going to have to happen, um, can you see a, a framework, uh, you know, being uh, practically achievable? Um, yeah, I mean, not easy. But Jerry, in fact, came into government uh, for a couple of meetings, at least in 2011, after the election result, and we had meetings with senior civil servants, and then what they call the policy unit. Um, and we drew up a proposal, which was based on what they did in Finland. So uh, you've given a pretty good summary of that, which is exactly they had a kind of national conversation, everyone from all ages was allowed to chip in, and there was no presumption. So you could just say, but this is what bothers me, you know, this is what I feel like to have. Um, I think, as I remember these conversations, Jerry, they, they eventually got a bit stumbled with the sheer data they got at the end. <laughs> um, but I think also it's a remarkably cathartic and reassuring thing for Finns, because one of the things we have to face up to as a state is the lack of trust uh, that exists between those who govern and those who are government. And, and so I think if one of these exercises has a benefit only just to say that you know, you know, we're, you know we're genuinely listening whatever. Um, and I do write about how actually we have to move away from the kind of didactic top-down politics that we currently have in Hollywood, which has actually unfortunately imitated Westminster, the sense of we'll come up with a policy, we'll throw it at you, we'll stick by it because else we'll get ripped off or you know, pissed taken out of us by the other parties, despite the fact that it may or may not work. There are countless examples of that, I'm afraid. Um, and, and, and that we have to come down to a point where actually politicians are more in the business of representing our views. Um, and I think we do have to have a conversation as a group, as I mentioned, about how we keep the energy now going forward. Because I, for one, am not going to now direct that back into a political party. Uh, you know, if, if given the opportunity to serve the government again, I would, because it, it's where things happen. But I don't think I would ever now want to go back into a political party and try that business of trying to ram my kind of the diversity of views into a narrow agenda, which ultimately ends up getting represented by one person. I see the need for that, but I don't see that to be the only vehicle for our views. So yeah, there is a model, and which we can pick up and do it, and I think there's a willingness to do it as well. And you know, it's one of the advantages of Scotland, five million people. Uh, there's a scale thing here, once you get much beyond that, it just becomes a lot of physical end. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, you talked about, um, we can do these things for ourselves, but we can, we can learn from other places. And um, I mean, if you have been to the James play, but, uh, Queen Margaret in the third one does this great speech in which she says, I'm Danish, you get an abusive lump on manure. I come from a rational nation with reasonable people. <laughs> and um, she's just you know, she's haranguing the, the three estates and the nobles. And, and the fact is, we are a rational people. You know, we, we kind of invented rationalism in many ways. We attributed much of us thinking. And as you just said, a lot of kind of good ideas get uh, skewered on the kind of system of government we have with people. I mean, the SNP came in in 2007, in 2011, with manifestos that are incredibly unambitious, uh, because that's what you have to do with manifestos. Yeah. There has to be two pens here, and a, a wee tweak here, and a wee tweak there. In fact, people are way beyond that. People are ready to accept quite... So, for example, nationalisation of railways would fly in Britain, yeah. but why is it not being done? So there's a, kind of, there's a kind of systematic problem with where people are and the kind of sensible things they want to do. Yes and the political system and how those sensible ideas either never get into the system or they get so uh, you know, corrupted. Yes, and, I mean, in 2011 one of the big issues was that the SNP's <coughs> manifesto for the 2011 election, uh, the SNP isn't a policy option. I don't think that's an insult, I don't think it's about I mean, that's just an observation. They deliberately obviously carried thought themselves forward trying to be as broad a card as possible. Uh, when they have gone into policy in the 1990s, they got burned a few times, and I think basically the front pen just said, I'm not going there again with a fresh idea. Um, but by 2011, that had, come, that had come to mean that the manifesto was in fact entirely a product of other parties. So the pledge on cops, on a thousand cops on the street, was actually from the Tories in a budget negotiation. The world leading green targets were from the Greens in a budget negotiation. The council tax freeze was an accident. It had only been brought in an attempt to make to cancel a local income tax, and it turned out that it worked. Um, and then there was a bunch of five special funds which were going to transform Scotland, 
And actually, they, they were a complete accident because it turned out that the buddy that had budged the fourth bridge had been overshot by a, mini, a billion and a bit. And so, in an embarrassingly random process, it got chopped up and, and set out as a kind of um, a series of speeches. Now, you know, let, let me be very clear about this. I'm very grateful that I had to be in the government, and, uh, uh, and, and I'm very grateful for the, the things I was able to do, and I think they've done a lot of good. But I think we do have to recognize in Scotland that A, partisanship blinds us to the faults of our own side, and we've got to be much more uh, upfront about that. B, this utterly mindless combat between Labour and the SNP is killing Scotland on one level. We, it's just impossible to get an idea out without having to align with one side or, or play some dark game and kind of statistics. Um, C, though, you can see that what's happened to the Labour Party, that is a gradual winnowing of effort and talent, will eventually happen to the SNP if we don't create a politics where actually it pays to have an opinion and, and occasionally to break ranks and to make a stand for stuff and, and occasionally, you know, now in retrospect, and boy, this is retrospect, but I didn't at the time, I, you know, when we realised we got a billion extra on the fourth bridge, obviously the things we then would say, ah, we don't even get anyone, a decent hand is what people want. Yeah, I've I don't have one at the moment, a decent hand. Yeah, I think the rough statistic is it's a I think it's 120,000 pounds is the rough arithmetic for a new house if you buy the land, build it, and you know, move it on into the social sector. But, I mean, how many is that in a billion then? You know, lots. Um, but, but, you know, we could have made some outstanding gesture towards social good, as opposed to another gesture which one, one puts. And whatever this clash says now about us is we've got to end a clash whereby the Labour Party in office don't even spend the because they're afraid of showing up the UK government, and the SNP in office only spend it on things which they think are immediately going to be attractive. Um, someone at some point has to say, Jesus, we've got a billion pounds spare in budget. That's fantastic. We can begin to build some permanent, long-lasting, and, you know, because the truth of the world is, we all know this is true, it's just bollocks the difference between the SNP and Labour. There are right-wingers in both, and there are extreme left-wingers in both too, but broadly, you know, these are people squabbling over the same idea. They've just got a different way of approaching the powers. Um, so I don't know if I answered that. That's not something that was a question. Oh, sorry, I've forgotten what my question was. Okay, so. I'll, I'll come back to that if you want. Yes, uh, yeah, I'll take a look at what's happened here. And again, lots of questions asked earlier about the referendum. How, how it's going to go, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really interested and I'm excited by the idea that I think we're going to follow the idea of the need for political cultural change. And it strikes me uh, that, that the opportunity lies firmly with the SNP, irrespective of the referendum outcome, to change the nature of politics. Now, I, I, I respect that, you know, I understand that that takes a huge amount of bravery to do that instead of playing the same old game, because that, when I've come down the BBC Parliament and watched the Scottish Parliament from afar, uh, I see too much of the Westminster type game going on, and I assume that's what's happening behind the scenes as well. But I think this debate about the, re you know, the referendum debate it is a fantastic platform. It's not an end in itself. Yeah. It's a platform to carry on a dialogue about political but, but you're absolutely right. An observation of being in government was this, is that um, I remember one minister once saying some civil service. Civil service was saying, oh, well, we're drawing up a list of all things you promised in your manifesto and seeing how we're doing. And the minister said, really? <laughs> 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 The point I'm trying to illustrate is that there is a slight sense of, of mismatch between what's trying to actually happen here. But one of the key things which I found really irritating with the civil service, and, and I think I'm sure they detected at the time, was that they listened to ministers. Um, it was incredibly frustrating that you have a whole series of work done, a whole series of ideas, a whole series of things. You catch the minister on a bad moment, you know, whatever it may be, and they kind of sort of go, mm, maybe at a meeting. And unfortunately, all these civil servants, armed with all this effort, time, great salaries, then are obliged, understandably, to say, well, but the minister went, mm -hmm. so why am I going to do any more work on this? <laughs> and and uh, again, this is not being, not being, being profoundly anti democratic, because obviously that's why you want the ministers. But it, it does strike me that the resource of the civil service in Scotland 
somehow could be more open or more responsive to a wider idea, a system of ideas, and actually, I don't know how, but, you, well, I do know how to. And yes, the SMB does have to change culture because when it became obvious to the civil service that the SMB were going to play quite a cautious card, the SMB, uh, the civil service played a cautious card. And that's all it needed, bizarrely, because you know, we write off the statements of politicians as just the stuff of the evening news. But to the civil service, they're really important. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you know, the, when a minister says, we are going to search for the new, let's say, that will be taken seriously. And if that is then backed up with some degree of tolerance of the new ideas that come forward, with some degree of listening, that can be revolutionary. Because I, you know, having attacked the civil service, the reason I was frustrated with it was it frequently came across people who obviously had a really valuable contribution to me and were up against this kind of wall of the turgid crap, basically, which was really hard to fight through to get your idea to where it was going to count. Um, and, and it's certainly true of the SP that they treated special advisors as being part of the modern wizardry of politics, unless as the what are we going to do, guys? Here's a range of ideas, how should we discuss it? Um, so, so I'd be rude to both sides. <laughs> so, Thomas, every time you hear someone talking about the future of the Scotland, quality and fairness are two of the big things that come up again and again. And from what you said earlier in your talk, I think you feel that between 1945 and 19. 80, that we were a more equal and fair society, which then sort of unraveled. So, if we're to build such a society in the future, what are the factors do you think that have made things unravel in 1980 that could happen again in the future of Well, of course, there's a global economic shock in the early 70s, and that had a sort of continuing effect in the late 80s, and the sense that I think the politicians didn't even have to respond to that. And now, if you look back at 1945, there was been a very big global economic shock in the form of the war. And so you have two different choices there about how you respond to shock. It seems to me that we're in the same period now, post 2008. How do we respond to that shock? Do we become imaginative, or do we go back? And I think the problems are, I mean, it's a very good and intelligent question which will take sort of a long time to unpick, but I think one of the key things is this, is that we've done that now. We have gone through that cycle of 45 to 80 to 2008. We are trying out ideas, and we were doing all that against a much weaker economic base and a much different demographic, demographic pattern. So I think my, my feeling is, and as I make, could, could not be clearer, who knows what's going to happen in the future. But I think one way you would overcome that is A, you are a richer society, B, people are happy raised to a higher standard, C, that I think there is an actual yearning for a return to some kind of common purpose. Um, I'm not saying maybe that pitches. Your question demands a sort of 20 page uh, analysis, which I've done from the year, and even that might disappoint you. Um, uh, but I, I think what we can do, and as I said, this lack of leadership, I think applies to the UK as a whole. I, I, I think we have to return to the idea that it's okay to talk about a common purpose and a moral purpose for a state. And, and I think we may be slightly lost sight of that. And I think we're still quite cautious about that language. A moral purpose suggests something really religious or something really blur, um, which, which I'm not saying. But I think we can go back to an old fashioned language which says, we are all this together. We can do this better. Um, but it's a product of experience and negotiation at the time. But it's. Yes. Um, I would just first like to say thank you because I found what you said very interesting and useful. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, Go on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the 20 years. Um, because that's quite a long time, especially if you're my age. Um, and I, I think 20 years is, is possibly okay, but I think we need to get back to the uh, better days of an early nation feeling during those 20 years, otherwise it's too long and we'll lose it. You know? And 
what I'm most intrigued about is what the effect is going to be in terms of the, the, the future of having that a, a proper constitution in Scotland in the event of, of well, when we win, shall we say. Um, and in particular, as far as nuclear disarmament is concerned, because that's, uh, that's something I've worked on for a, a very long time. And I'm very aware that um, there's, a, there's a, a sense in which we're almost, we almost have the idea that in Scotland seeking nuclear disarmament, which would be nuclear disarmament for the whole of the UK, when it happens, uh, that, that we're somehow out of step. Uh, whereas actually we would become the 94th of 93 countries out of that 106 uh, So that, that would be a huge, huge change. And the other aspect to that, which is also about looking towards not just social justice, but, but a, a better way of dealing with difference and conflict um, uh, across the board, would be the, the idea that Scotland would then have to have a national action plan under Security Council Resolution 1325, which would include a much higher percentage of women being involved in negotiations on conflict. And I, I think that the better gender balance that we already enjoy in the Scottish Parliament means that that's a really, that is a really strong possibility that could make a really big difference to how those early days could feel. So I, I'd like to ask you what your, whether you think I'm being supremely optimistic or if you... I think I do. Um, uh, so, whilst entirely agreeing with the principle that China is an abomination and should be removed, I couldn't, and I still can't get past the idea that after a yes vote, when you're around that negotiation table, and there are a variety of wild cards at play, that it won't be tried that's played to buy quick entry to the EU currency. But despite the motion that's just gone through? I, yeah, yes. Uh, I, I think uh, it's my view, it, uh, and, and I'm not emphasise enough that this was never discussed. Like, genuinely, it was never discussed the first minute. I'm not reflecting any inside view here. It's my view. Yeah. But uh, the, here's how I see a post yes moment. Uh, actually, it's not London that matters so much, it's probably Washington and Berlin. Yeah. yeah. And exactly, and they say, well, look, we've got a world and a state of complete flux at the moment, we can't possibly have some kind of mess going on in the middle of home. Uh, so we're going to have a quick solution to this, guys, whether you love them or ever particularly like it. We're going to go for the easy route, so for the global markets, the currency union is the easy route and for the banks and everything like that. We're going to go for quick access to the EU because that's just going to happen whether the rest of the EU like it or not. And Germany will ensure that does happen. But you're keeping China out. Now, I've I, I thought about it a lot. I just, that's my hunch. Now, my hunch is also that you, around that table, you'd then say, well, great, but we're taking two billion a year in terms of rent or something. I mean, you know, you can ma try and maximize that position as much as possible. So that's my gloomy prognosis. My more uh, optimistic one is that um, if you're absolutely right in the early days, you have to do some things which signal we are different. And my other kind of strange thing about the way the government's side with the yes campaign is that will change, but there won't be much change. I actually think you have to say it will change and will change. Now, that change may take a long time. It may take well, 10, 20, whatever years, but we will change. So, for instance, your pensions and everything will continue just to flow across the border as they normally do, because that will be part of the deal. But there will be a commitment that in five years' time we're going to do that differently, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, it's just my, my hunch, but my hunch is that. But, but that doesn't in any way diminish the argument which says that we as a nation are allowed to get revolution, and that that is a powerful and important thing to do. So, if the argument remains valid, you would. Just a quick question. Uh, I wanted to ask about, you mentioned pensions earlier, and I wondered what your viewpoint was on welfare, because we're, we're talking a lot in all of these talks about Scotland becoming a more equal society, a more fair society. And at the moment, from West Minster, we're seeing the demonisation of disabled people 
people like myself, I've experienced that um, it's an awful, but uh, it, um, unemployed people, um, and it, it's disgusting what's happening. I wonder what your point of view was on that uh, and how that could be rectified. But also, um, if we're going to have a, a fairer society, people need to get involved more. Um, so how, how do you see that happening? Okay. Um, well, where sometimes I have to put a little argument in Scotland that can get next day is the uh, someone downside says we need to reform welfare and everyone in Scotland just goes, oh no, you're not. And we also gather around that idea as a kind of protective thing. I, welfare almost certainly does have to be reformed on the level that for a lot of people it's not working. Um, unfortunately, Ian Duncan Smith, having said that's what he was going to try and do in his conversion class or whatever it was, he didn't remember, uh, seems to have completely lost sight of that. Um, and just gone for the budget cuts. And, and, and again, budget cuts which, which aren't then explained to everyone. It's not said, for example, that you know, whatever you may be losing now, that don't worry, over a period of time, everyone's going to lose a little bit. But by the way, here's, here's where we're going to. It's just cut. And so that's, that's brutal. But, but equally, as I say, we, we've got to, it's got to have a discussion about welfare and pensions and these things because you know, they've got to work and so we're going to pay for them. We can't just keep asking young workers to do that for us. But I think what's really interesting about Ian Duncan Smith is this. Here's a man who said 10 years to think about reform government. Got the complete support of his cabinet. Got the complete support of Whitehall behind him. Apparently has a secret bunker somewhere, this man could just be a myth, but where he's got the brightest and the best working on reform of welfare. There is nothing standing in the way of Ian Duncan Smith reforming welfare in the UK. I cannot tell you how much any politician would want that combination of time, political support, and budget. He's got it all. So rare. And it's not working. And this is a really crucial point. And I don't actually mean, you know, in any way to knock Ian Duncan Smith. Maybe at times he does acting out of the jumble of human emotions that we all have. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's a budget cut, whatever. Mm -hmm. My point is, though, is that the UK operates with a series of accretive policies, like sort of gunk on the bottom of a boat. And scraping that off and starting again is near impossible with the current structure of the UK. So actually, Paradoxically, if you do want to reform welfare and make it more accountable to the citizens, you are probably much better off giving that power to Scotland and saying, here, you have a shot at this, and we'll copy what you do a few years later once you've done a few screw-ups along the way. Actually, that would be quite an intelligent way to manage policy within the UK. But you see, it's impossible to manage those large overarching policies such as NHS and welfare and pensions, again, when you're operating from such a diverse economic base. Also, such a diverse political base. You know, the, the desire in some parts, or when it become discussed welfare reform, is purely they're scroungers, we need to get the money back. And it's, it, no one is making the argument which says, no, this is an expression of our civilization. This is, this is one of the wonderful things we've done. And by that, we might have to change it. But where is the politician standing up for the idea that the state generates wealth which it recycles to its people in order that those people who haven't been so lucky or whatever, whatever, you know, are getting support? No one makes that case. Why not? If I was fighting for the union, Jesus, I'd be, I'd be standing up there saying, you know, that's what we're about. And why not? Because Ed Miliband doesn't want to go into 2015 election hooked on some kind of promise about welfare. And why not? Because Edmund Bann has to convince the South East of England to vote for him, because it's not just enough that Scots and North East do. And therefore, we get to the Labour paradox, which is they can talk all they like about their history and their tradition, or some of which is fantastic. But for Labour to be power in the UK now, they have to stop being Labour. And therefore, there is no solution in that part. And therefore, we would be better Becoming independent and most probably having a Labour government of them. Like, it baffles me why apparently socialism only works in the whole UK, it doesn't work in Scotland. Um, I think uh, a referendum, there will be an election in two, two years' time for the yes vote. And my question is this about Labour, just for what you were talking about. Uh, Martha Gore was in Pollock 
uh, and I went to the opening of the Yes Pollock premises. Lo and behold, we got someone to meet and all the rest of it. It was a big view, there was hundreds of people there. Uh, and even so, there was two buses from Air Day, Revolution in the air. Uh, now these are all Labour voters, and this is the heart of John Lamont's constituency. Right? Now, they're full of optimism for the referendum. Now, the next thing that happened to me was, I went to the First Minister's question time, which was the first time Alex Sam was in public after the Alistair Garden debate, and I just so happened to be sitting, unfortunately, behind the Labour MSPs. Uh, and all it was was uh, Plan B, Plan B, and they were like a tribe of chimpanzees. I've, no, I, I've, never, I've never seen such a bunch of people who have no conception that they're actually in the public eye. They're in the Scottish Parliament, television cameras, 300 people behind them. And I thought, these people have got no function in the world. Uh, now the question is, what happens after the referendum, if there's a yes vote, there's a general election? What's going to happen to the historical energy of the Labour Party? And how are people Pollock going to benefit? What's going to happen to people Pollock? Um, it, it's, it's a great question. People in Pollock stand, let's say, a 33% chance of being completely ignored as the neoliberal wing in the SP and Labour, but I might have been involved in this new nation, takes over and they get really excited about all the new tools of the state and actually don't end up redistributing really anything. There's another 33% chance which says that actually we really do set about reinventing the state. And, and that therefore these people really benefit in some profound way. But that requires a lot of other changes to go along with it. Or there's a chance that we bundle along in our usual way. So you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm promoting a view of Scotland, which isn't, we're not, not what we're voting on. You know, we're, we're rather just voting on one possible choice as to how we start that. And I also completely agree that. Uh, as has been the norm for Scotland for 30 years, a lot of what politicians say about helping people call it is box. In the, in the mean at the time, but you know, by the time it comes to any kind of serious test in budgets or whatever, it doesn't turn up. Um, and so that's why, that's why I left government, partly because there's just a, you know, there's only so many papers and speeches you can write about great social transformation before you go, you know, when are we actually going to do this? <laughs> you know, did that speech two years ago. Um, and not, you know, uh, but that's the nature of government, you know, and that's just a silly event that uh, they need to get bored. But it, it's not automatic by any means. And the consensus that we need is a consensus which I think is forming out with the parties at the moment. But I do also think, so, that there's something interesting will happen. Even if it's known, I don't see the British Labour Party ever electing a Scottish leader again. Because they're never going to think it's going to be no for I don't think, you know, everyone's going to kind of, you know. So I think Douglas Alexander actually has a bit of a problem on his hands um, in terms of his career, which might cause him to come back to Scotland, which would be a good thing, actually. Um, I, and I think that applies to some of the MPs as well, actually. And, and it would be a good thing if we got over that kind of mess. I think also the 2015 election, I don't see they were winning it. Um, and so I think that would also cause some kind of change. And I think also that lovely maverick loony, Gordon Brown, um, who, who, who is that just perfect mix of, of anger and brilliance and, and whatever. Um, you know, he said two days ago that now in two years' time he's expecting the UK to be a federal state. Um, which is odd, because <laughs> the Labour proposition paper is certainly not a federal state, this is a truly around the tax. But I still think we live in a ferment of ideas, and that's the best thing that we can possibly do is keep that ferment alive and not allow anyone to capture it. And, and, and I think you can easily see that the talk of social justice doesn't actually sit that well with Alex Hammond. It's not really good for you, I think. Um, it doesn't mean he doesn't believe it. I, I don't think he's just used to a different way of fighting an argument. And I think there's something about the way the Scottish Parliament functions, which actually you could equally say, I wonder, if, there, if there's a no vote, I wonder whether in retrospect the SFP will think it's so great that its MSPs are quite so organised. And, 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 um, and perhaps we could have done with a bit more uh, you know, voices and, and noise, a bit more um, with your approach, which sort of 
who uh, are a bit more kind of moved. Um, yes, just me. The gentleman spoke about people of colour, and you've spoken a lot about names of consensus. Is the real problem not that something like colour, which is a problem for generations, there is no consensus on what we should do. We know there's something badly wrong in colour to help it, but there's no real agreement as to the way forward. And that is the real problem. Yeah, yeah, which, which is a good one. So, one person I would strongly recommend you go and listen to. Uh, and I, I keep trying to get to write a book, so again, you should do this actually in general, you're going to play the records. Um, is a former uh, medical officer of the government. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because exactly part of what he's arguing, which struck me as very highly attractive, was that we are hooked on this idea that there has to be a national solution to everything and a policy which has worked out over two years and tested by all sorts of people chipping in, whatever. Part of this thing, which I think is very attractive, is the idea that we just allow communities to get on with some doing their own thing, building up their own models and things. But we don't obsess about this idea of central control. Partly also, the money is there in the budget. We make choices about what we spend our money on. And actually, that budget is never, in my opinion, sufficiently interrogated as to why we're making certain choices. Um, you know, the most egregious of these choices, in my opinion, is a tiny amount of money that just really is that land and estates don't pay business tax. Uh, they were let off this 20 years ago, you might remember when I did, but they were let off a certain level of tax because it was thought they kept gamekeepers in jobs. And, now, fair enough, you know, a gamekeeper is a job, it's as good a job as any other, I certainly don't want to take a job from someone. But if you actually begin to interrogate the way that Scotland is organised, where it raises its money and where it spends its money, I do not buy into the idea that we couldn't find extra money for those areas that we, we consensually think is desperately needed. And the thing, the message of hope I want to bring you is that I may have left the chair, but I've sat on the chair, so to speak, which was advising policy to ministers. And it's not that they just go, shut up, but they kind of get confused in a whole medley of other things. But one very important point about <laughs> sitting in Parliament or in St Andrew's House is this. There's a deafening silence from outside. If you should be so foolish to write a speech which actually suggests something new, oh, then everyone will leap on you. But if you simply say as a policy person, you know, bring me your ideas, write something positive in a paper or on a website arguing for X, well, I can count on my hand how many people will do that. And I can tell you that the refrain on my phone, someone said, well, it's not be doing X, and I said, can I go out there and make a noise for X? Because you know what politicians do? They react to noises out there. They don't react to noises in government. Once you're employed by government, you've been effectively sort of castrated by government. So you only become useful as a choir. I'm getting lost in the metaphor next time. But you do partially become castrated, and you need the voices outside. And trust me, we may now think we're all very good at chipping in ideas and being active, and I'll be doing scouts because we're also argumentative. But when you're sitting in an exercise, it's virtually silent. Um, and it's very hard to, sorry. Uh, it's, so, uh, yeah. So, it's not right here. Oh, all right. Can you already? Uh, well, uh, we were just talking about uh, subsidies through tax cuts. Right. It's part of what you could call a neoliberal ideology, as it is not having wealth attached, as it's privatizing or uh, outsourcing, right? <laughs> Well, my point is that I'm from Norway, and uh, just uh, listening to what you were saying about the, not being the Nordics, uh, etc. Um, in in Norway, that neoliberal ideology, you know, has a, um, is very convincing as well, and has a lot of power and attraction. And I think that we in Norway, and in all the Nordic countries, actually look to the U.S. and to Britain for how we want our countries to be in the future. It's kind of paradoxical because here in Scotland, you're looking towards the Nordics for how you can become less like the UK and the US. You know? So I think that's very interesting. And um, one example is that in Norway right now, we're considering abolishing wealth tax. And, uh, and the current government is a right-wing government also wants to privatize some rail lines. So just to show how it works. But, um, I do think that, that you should retain the Nordic model as a model, obviously you don't have to become the Nordics, but the Nordics are a very heterogeneous group. Uh, for example, Finland is not a Scandinavian country, but it's still a Nordic country. 
and there are many other ways there's a lot of discrepancy within the Nordics, because if you don't have that as a model, you might just end up as another Republic of Ireland, you know, just kind of getting sucked into this yep. ruling global ideology. Can I cut you off? Because for the first time in my life, I actually found some that I've written yeah. which agrees with someone else. And I found it in the book during a public session. <laughs> <laughs> in the Nordic model, we gloss over the many differences between Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, and we ignore the bits we don't like. By idealizing them, they become unreal and eventually meaningless. This applies in particular forms of welfare, by which I mean the full operations of the state to nurture its citizens. Across Europe, no welfare systems the same, not the same, beyond the consistencies. And then I go on to write about the danger of politics of having an idealized state, um, which is obviously self explanatory. So, Yes, we're all in that business of looking at each other, and that goes on in every single <coughs> But the crucial thing is, it's not because you pass a law that the law defines you, it's because you wanted to pass the law. And in Scotland, we're still struggling with this kind of rather uh, simplistic structural sense of politics, which says, oh, we'll have that law, we'll have that law, we'll have that law, and it will be grand. And then it all kind of goes a bit wrong. We're not having a conversation which says, do we think this is a fair society? How do we think we might get fair? What could we try out in that model of having some different things? What are we prepared to be humble enough about to say, do you know that didn't work? Do you know what classic example is? It's the statistics over small class sizes. Now, this is fascinating. Small classes are classes about 10 years ago, the policy terms were the buzz thing. The smaller the class size, the better the, the, the education, basically. And there seemed to be lots of evidence behind it, and it seemed to be really persuasive. And so the, there was a well, the classic rag between Labour and the SP about who's going to the smallest class size. You know, and none of them read the research or whatever, but they were just now in a battle to have the smallest possible class sizes. Uh, the SP failed to get small class sizes, didn't have the face just to say, do you know what, actually, it's right side now. What's the WP policy anyway? Because there's lots of counter research which says that's not the most important thing. They were then hooked up on the no, that's small class sizes. Well actually they blame it, so screw small class sizes, let's go with big class sizes because you want small class sizes. <laughs> and in the last ten years in Scottish education, a lot of the times we're occupied by the issue of the size of the class, and during that period of ten years the evidence on the size of the class has utterly changed. But it is impossible for a current political system to say, hmm, maybe we should have a reason. 